Now you've heard the term riding the bevel. I can remember uh, at a workshop one time, a hands-on workshop, one fellow had been turning longer than I had and had a, had a better leg than I did. He was having a hard time throwing chunks of wood and I was watching a little bit and I said, can I make an observation? He said, yeah. I said, well, you really need to ride the bevel. Said, you know, and then I showed him what I was talking about and that's it. That edge right there in the illustrate. Let me get out my large bowl gouge here. That's the bevel. That's what you're riding. And, and probably a better term, Stuart Banny used the term gliding the bevel. Someone else calls floating the bevel. You can't really rub on that bevel, you won't really cut. It's got to come off that bevel just a little bit. But only a little bit because this is providing the support right here for that, that cut. And if you press too hard, then you wind up with drywood, you wind up with that heating, uh, heating, but also you don't cut as much. You get too far up and you wind up in a scraping mode, and uh, you just don't get as, as clean, a, clean a cut. So you're pushing the, the bevel in the direction of the cut. So when I make my entry cut, for example, there's the bevel. The tool gouge is going to come all the way over here because this bevel is going to be almost 90 degrees to the work. And I tend to brace that entry cut with my finger because if you're not careful, you will have a tendency if you don't get it exactly right to kick back on you. So you can see the angle to get that 90 degrees. Once you make the entry cut, it doesn't take a whole lot to support it. But making that entry cut, if you're not careful, it can skate across the, the surface of the rim. So now I can adjust the tool rest. I can go ahead and angle it in a little bit. Now I can hold the flute somewhere in the direction of probably two o'clock. Sometimes I hold it very clock and then you just twist it a little bit until you feel, feel like it's, it's right for you. Sometimes as you go in, you can open it up a little bit more. Now this thing's going at about 650 RPMs. I could probably turn it a little bit faster. Obviously, it's 650 RPMs in the middle, it's 650 RPMs on the outside, but the miles per hour is a lot less as you get toward the middle. It's just going real slow in the middle. because it's So you gotta take your time. As you approach the middle, you gotta slow down your tool work. You start off with one speed, but the more you get to the middle, you just gotta slow down, slow down and let the, let the wood come to your, your tool. I just feel this is slinging water wet. I mean, I just feel the, the moisture. You can see it. It's like like taking a shower. I just want to give you a kind of a, a warm up on that. I'm not going to finish this one. I'm going to set this one aside. We're going to pick up on the next stage. You know. I've had pretty good, it depends on, the, it depends on the wood, it depends on the where you're storing it, uh, it depends on how big a bowl it is. If it's a small bowl, I would say this one I can put it in a bag and I feel pretty comfortable probably turning it in three months, maybe less. I've had some that i pushed it and waited as little as six weeks. Uh, you, can, you can get a scale, like a food scale, and you can measure it. It also makes a difference if it's been sitting out uh, on your wood pile a while. For example, I brought some, uh, this brad for pear. I've had this brad for pear, it's definitely green. Uh, it's been sitting outside my house for a year. It's green, it's not dry. 
but but the difference between this wood and this wood, I didn't want to demonstrate on this one because it's going to be it's more like turning into dry wood because I wouldn't get these nice big wet wet damp shavings. So that's another another factor. If you if it's been sitting about six months, it's going to be quite a bit drier than than one that's that's fresh cut like this uh, silver maple that I'm, I'm turning. So it. It's one of those, it, it kind of depends answer. It really, it really does depend. And, and you can speed it up. I've never had a need to speed it up. I just put it in a bag, check it every couple of days, change the bag out because it'll, it'll get, get that bag kind of damp. Uh, and then you just gotta, gotta experiment. Small bowls, three or four weeks in some instances. Especially if, if, if there's no pit in there and I leave it in the basement. It'll dry a lot faster in the basement than it will out in my uh, garage. So I reach in, I go in my garage, and I, I open up a bag, and I pull out a bowl. In this case, I didn't put anchor seal on it. I used uh, uh, shrink wrap tape, which also tends to work pretty well. And I just, I just wrap it on the outside, and that tends to force the moisture drying on the inside, which is, a, which is a good thing. You can see it was picking up just a little bit of mold. And this was only turned three weeks ago. I think I turned this the day after I got the. Uh, the invite to come down here and, and, and turn a piece of a courage bowl with y'all. So this one is definitely probably not dry, but on the other hand, it's turned three weeks ago. Let's just see how much movement there's been. Some species will move. You know, if you use sweet gum, you're gonna have a lot more of a problem with movement than you would with ash uh, or uh, walnut. In this case, it's a, just a little over six and a quarter that way. It's just there's not a sixteenth of an inch difference in the two directions on this on this silver maple three weeks later, and it was out in my garage. Uh, it'll probably still move. Uh, I'm pushing it. thing we're going to do is we're going to true up the bottom. You can push it, you can push this thing up against the chuck jaws if you like, that can work. I tend to, to want to use some type of friction chuck. So here's just a block and I glued a little bit of fun foam on it. And this is mostly so I can extend the bowl away from the, the chuck. This is at least six weeks. I hope it doesn't move too much when I'm through. Now I left the mark. You don't ever take the mark off the bottom when you're rough turning it. So that makes that that allows me to, to get that live center right back into that, that center point there. Check the tenon size, make sure I didn't get it too small. I have room to tweak it, but not much more. So I'm going to use this detail spindle gouge, which means it doesn't have a very deep flute, so it's got a lot of steel. It's very strong, very stiff. You can hang over the tool rest, and it's got a little sharper point than, than a typical spindle gouge. And you can see it's wobbling a little bit. See if we can turn it a few degrees and see if we can change. We can turn it up to 850. Again, I'm bracing this with my with my thumb in case I get a little bit of kickback. Run that bevel directly down direction of the, the lay bed. Make sure I got a nice clean corner. Over here in that corner. And that looks good. Now 
Now, for a bowl this size, I generally use a half-inch bowl down. That's the way the Americans do it, not the British. I've never understood the British. It's like you measure from the inside here to the outside there, something. But only on bowl gouge, not on spindle gouge. It's kind of strange. But, but this is a Doug Thompson half-inch. So it's a half-inch stick, and it's a good size for a bowl this size. Pick up the cut. And I don't pull it down too much, so it feels feel like it's running pretty through. I was picking it up there a little bit. I've got a pretty clean surface. I'd be about ready to sand it. Let me take a little bit more off here. I'm not going to do any sanding in here, and I'm not even going to finish this. I'm just going to go through all these processes. So you'll know how to do this. Any questions so far? I'll take off my friction chuck. Uh, it's called fun foam. It's a closed cell foam you pick up at Michael's or Hobby Lobby. It's about a dollar sheet. They come in sheets like that. It's, you'll see it in arts and crafts where they make little toys out of it. it it's, uh, it's real cheap. Works good. I use it on a vacuum chuck uh, at home. All right, first thing I want to do is true up the, the face to make sure this is nice and flat. Go back to the bigger There's two ways you can do this. You can either cut it this way and come across. Some people like to do a full cut where it's more vertical. I want you to do like a scraper. And that works too. I don't feel it bouncing. I got a little bit more to go. things around, inevitably they never run through. But if you can leave the walls fairly thick, in this case, I'd make this probably uh, you know, probably maybe a half an inch, maybe three-eighths of an inch thick. Uh, probably wouldn't go much smaller than that. Uh, I don't care if it's a little bit out of round on the outside. Uh, Chances are, if we hold that thing, it's not going to be that big a visual difference. I'll be able to tell when I uh, uh, do the inside. Some people want to come back out and do the outside of the bowl and true it up from here, but I don't think it's, for me, it's normally not necessary or, or worth that effort. So we're just going to angle this in. Okay, make sure it's not going to rub. Again, frame it out here so that bevel is going to come straight in. Taking that just a little bit. And it's going to be doing a little bouncing.
talked about putting anchor seal on that stuff. Y'all know what I mean about anchor seal? It's a wax emulsion stuff. It's fairly pricey, uh, but you've got some clubs that buy it in bulk and break it down and, and sell about a gallon, and it's not too bad. Um, you don't have to use that. I just find sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Depends on the wood and the time of the year and how I'm going to uh, dry it. A lot of times I don't put any on it, but I found that uh, that shrink wrap tape tends to work pretty well too, and it's fast and speed. You know, wrap it around there, and that that'll help. I normally don't push put any on the inside. I just put it on the outside to force force the drying on the inside. Time to check this with some digital calipers here. Uh, it's easy enough to make one of these uh, depth gauges. This is a some kind of plumbing fitting. I don't know what kind. Frank kind of has this on his website. It's in here with a hole drilled through it. So when you tighten it, it, it floats loose. It pulls against this brass rod and holds it tight. You hold it up flat on the inside, and then hold it on the outside, and just eyeball it out, and I've got at least three quarters of an inch, so I can go a little bit further, but don't want to go much further on the bottom. And if you got these kind of calipers, that will generally work pretty well for a bowl. It'll do almost all of it, except you can't measure that, that bottom that bottom width uh, with it, but you can come do pretty well with that a depth gauge. But you can measure the wall fitness pretty good by just you tighten this thing and then you leave a little bit of a gap then you come down to see how that gap changes and it's like all of a sudden I run out of gap on going any further so I know it's thicker than thicker than that as I go down just a little way so I know I've got a little further to go and I can actually feel that. At some point in time, sometimes I give up on the bowl gouge, and that doesn't bother me. And I'll resort to using a scraper, because it's easy to get rid of ripples, and it's easy to deal with the flat wall on the bottom. The other possibility is I switch to a different kind of bowl gouge with a, a very flat grind, a uh, very steep grind, about maybe 65, 70 degrees. The problem is when you come down and make that transition, those gouges that I have, once you start making that transition, you can't keep the bevel floating on it because it's too sharp an angle. These are probably about 45 degrees and you just can't make that, you lose the bevel along the bottom. When you start swinging, you got to come off and you start making little ridges. So you make what they call a bottom feeder, put a little long handle on it. This is a, not a real fancy, this is a Benjamin's best. I only use it for this, but you use it for making that transition along the bottom. I don't want to get as much support in here for that scraper. I've got a little bit of a negative rake, so I've taken a little bit off the edge here. It makes it a little more, uh, I'll say, user friendly. I want to cut on the center. Have it just about flat.
we'll, we'll, we'll sand that. Uh, I'm going to leave some of these rough edges on it because I'm just going to, I'm mostly trying to show you the process and steps because I don't have time in this demo to get through all the steps and do a perfectly finished uh, box. Uh, 